Oh, hello, uh, a very good morning to all of you. I am Deep Joy Mampilli, uh, Deputy Director, Press Information Bureau, Mumbai. And it is my hearty, uh, it is my privilege to extend a hearty welcome to all of you to this webinar on National Education Policy 2020, a new vision for higher education in India. The webinar is being organized by Regional Outreach Bureau, Maharashtra and Goa, and Press Information Bureau, Western Region, under the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Government of India. At the outset, I would like to inform all our viewers who are watching this uh, webinar on YouTube that you may ask your questions to our expert panel through the YouTube live chat facility, which is available to the right of the YouTube live stream. And let me begin by recalling the words of former president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He said, and I quote, real education enhances the dignity of a human being and increases his or her self-respect. If only the real sense of education could be realized by each individual and carried forward in every field of human activity, the world will be so much a better place to live in. Unquote. Yes, India's ability to provide high quality educational opportunities to our big population of young people will play a decisive role in determining the future of our country. And the national education policy lays out a vision to achieve this, considering the needs of our 21st century knowledge society. We are fortunate to have with us today an eminent panel of speakers who will share their rich perspectives on this very topical subject. It's my honor to welcome Professor Himanshu Rai, Director, Indian Institute of Management, IAM, Indore. Professor Rai has a diverse experience in teaching, research, training, and strategic consultancy in both public and private sectors. His core area being human resource management. His research interests include negotiation, cross-cultural issues, management and religion, spirituality, and gender. His research spans an eclectic range and always has a strong philosophical underpinning to it. A very hearty welcome to you, Professor Rai. We are also joined by uh, Mr. Subramanian Krishnamurthy, the Chief Executive Officer of Macademia Education Group, Dubai. Mr. Krishnamurthy is a visionary educationist steering the oldest and most popular test preparation institute in United Arab Emirates. He specializes in training programs for gifted and talented students, and he is an enthusiast in experiential learning and education, and, and, and education through travel. He is also involved in promoting vocational education in both India and UAE. A very hearty welcome to you too, Mr. Krishnamurthy. And it's my privilege to also welcome Sri Manish Desai, Director General, West Zone, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Government of India. As Director General, Sri Desai leads the Government of India's communication system in six states, namely Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Goa, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Chhattisgarh. In a public service communication career spanning more than three decades, Sri Desai has held many responsible positions in government, including as the Press Registrar of India. A very hearty welcome to you to Sri Desai, sir. And I now request Director General West Sod, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Government of India, Sri Manish Desai, to give his opening remarks on the national education policy and to basically set the context for our discussion today. Over to you, sir. Thank you and good morning, everybody. First of all, uh, on, on behalf of the West Zone, I would like to once again extend hearty welcome to Professor Himanshu Rai, 
and Subramanian Krishnamurti on this webinar for having accepted our invitation to be part of this webinar and throw light on the implementation strategies for the national education policy, which has been recently announced. Uh, I'll just begin saying that it was 29th July that the Union Cabinet approved this National Education Policy 2020. The government has said that this policy would bring in transformational reform in school and higher education. In fact, national education policy had been in the making for over three to four years. Wide ranging consultations were held, and the government received more than two and a half lakh suggestions from cross section of people. It was in June 2017 that the committee for, the, for drafting the national education policy was constituted under the chairmanship of uh, eminent scientist and former head of ISRO, Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan. And finally, this committee submitted its report in May 2019, and it was put up for public consultation again as it process with all the policies in government of India. I mean, finally, the union cabinet approved it in July. And in fact, I mean, it's up to 34 years that a new education policy is being introduced in India. The timing is crucial because India is going to have the largest working age population in the world by 2030. If we need to capitalize on India's remarkable democratic dividend, we need to act now. To do this, it is essential not only to improve the quality of education, but also to make it relevant in terms of providing employment opportunities. For years, it is felt that our education system has remained unchanged, leading to lopsided priorities where people were focusing on either becoming a doctor, an engineer, or lately a lawyer, ever since the introduction of integrated law, law education in the country. I mean, in real sense, there has been no mapping of interest, ability, and demand per se. So education policy, national education policy has come in as a game changer. The recommendations made in the education policy can be classified into three broad categories. Those relating to the school education, those relating to higher education, and thirdly, the recommendations for structural reform that are common to both school and higher education. When it comes to the school education, the most striking change is the replacement of the two 10 plus 2 system by 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 pattern. And this has been one of the key highlights of the national education policy. First five years of this scheme will be foundational schools where learning will be largely through play way method. It has been ascertained that 85% of cumulative brain development of a child takes place by the age of six. And hence it is a crucial stage for preparing the future scientists, engineers, professors, administrators, and managers. Coming to the higher education side, the gross Enrollment ratio in higher education is slated to be raised to 50% by 2035. By 2035, I mean that is there will be an addition of three and a half crore new seats in the higher education field. That's a massive expansion which we are, which the government is thinking of. This apart, flexible curricula, creative combination of subjects, integration of vocational education and multiple entry and exit points with appropriate certification are the other key highlights of, in the higher education sector. We are finally coming, moving towards the four-year UG undergraduate education system also. I mean, it can be up to three years or even four years with multiple exit options. That is one of the things. Like, for example, right now, if an engineering student has enrolled for a four-year course, and after three years for any reason, for family reason or for any economic reason, he discontinues, his qualification will be adjusted only as pulse standard, uh, nothing else, because he's out of the system. He is not a qualified engineer. But under the new system, there will be a certificate after one year, a diploma after two years, bachelor's degree after three years, or a bachelor's with research after four years. This kind of a flexibility is being proposed to be introduced under the national education policy. 21st century is the era of globalization and ever increasing institutional competition. This is the time increased focus on learning, research, and innovation 
has to be played. Hence, there is a proposal to create a national research foundation as an apex body for fostering strong research culture and building research capacity across higher education. You may also be aware that MPhil, which was an intermediate research level, has been it, it plans to be scrapped. I mean, there will be a direct PhD will be there. This policy also lays great trust on online and digital education too. We in Press Information Bureau, that is commonly known as PIB, have been analyzing the reactions to the National Education Policy 2020. We have gone through, we have sifted through a large number of editorials that have appeared in newspapers. I mean, in my case, in the six states of the West Zone. This policy has been welcomed by many quarters. Although some people have mentioned that there is an excessive trust on privatization and or co corporatization. There are others who opine, opine that this policy paves the way for meaningful public-private partnership, which empirical evidence has suggested that delivers better outcomes. As India moves towards becoming a knowledge economy and a knowledge society, more and more young Indians are likely to aspire for higher education. And we need to lay a good foundation for that. The quality of higher education system is inherently linked to strong foundations of the school education about which I mentioned earlier, about the formative years. Uh, despite some differences, there is an agreement that this policy has attempted to break many silos and watertight compartments that had existed in our education system. Today, it's not for me to speak much because we have two eminent speakers on the panel who would be sharing their thoughts about the new national education policy and also explain the roadmap as to how this policy can shape the new India to real world application oriented education. Deep, you began by quoting our former president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. I would like to end by quoting the civil rights activist Malcolm X. He said, education is the passport for the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, perspective on the national education policy and how it uh, lays a roadmap for preparing the future of India, considering the needs of the 21st century. Uh, thank you, sir. I now request uh, Director I. M. Indor, Professor Himanshu Rai, to share his analysis of the national education policy, especially the key strengths of the policy uh, and what are the challenges involved in translating the vision embodied in the policy into reality on the ground. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deep, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Manishji. Uh, considering that uh, both of you either started or ended with a quote, let me start with an axiom that I've always lived by so far as education is concerned, and that's a Socratic axiom. So Socrates said, education and learning is the progressive realization of your own ignorance. And that's a brilliant statement to make. Education and learning is the progressive realization of your own ignorance. The more you learn, the more you get educated, the more you realize how ignorant you are. Because you know, if you have learned in only one subject, you might think that that is it, that that's the end of the knowledge. But the moment you start learning about other things, you realize that there is so much more to learn. And that, I believe, is the biggest strength of the NEP 2020. This focus on multiple things, this focus on multiple subjects, this focus on multiple languages, right in the initial stage, that is the biggest strength that NEP 2020 brings to our country. And Manish Ji made a very important point that the human brain, by and large, is fully developed by the age of six. In fact, most of the psychologists say that by and large, by the age of three, it's in a fairly advanced stage of development. And that, I think, is the second important thing that I would want to talk about when it comes to the pre-primary education. So the fact that we have brought even pre-primary education into the ambit of NEP 2020 does two things. First of all, pre-primary education being predominantly in the unorganized sector 
was the one which was prone to a lot of misuse and it was prone to say cut up methods or, or rather methods where nobody knew as to why they were being charged whatever it is that they were being charged and there was completely absolutely no control over what went and what was given to the children so i think by bringing that into the ambit what we have done is that we are going to regulate even the pre primary part and the second important thing is that now the mid day meals will be available even to the pre primary children and that's a huge thing because if you provide good nutrition to children at the age of 3 you are ensuring that the brain develops well just like manish ji pointed out by the age of 6 so i think that's the biggest thing that the nep brings in so far as the school is concerned at both in the pre primary as well as primary level now considering that i'm predominantly supposed to speak about uh, the higher education now there are two things that i see which are extremely significant and these are the big strengths so far as nep is concerned the first is the creation of the academic credit bank and that's a brilliant thing to do because many a times what people do is either because of personal reasons or because of financial reasons want to take a break so for example if i'm doing 4 years of engineering and after 2 years i realize that i have certain family obligations and therefore i need to go back and do something for my family then when i come back after say a year or two i have to start again from the first year but now what this nep does is it allows me to keep those credits in the bank and thereafter if i wish to come back and resume my engineering i can start once again from th the third year because i already have the two years in credit and that i think is a big deal now a lot of people pointed out saying that hey this may lead to a higher dropout no not at all I, in fact i find that argument bizarre it will not lead to dropout but it will need to up to a higher enrollment ratio simply because people know that there is a flexibility and they know that whatever formal education that they are getting is going to get some value obviously education has value no matter whether you create an academic credit bank or not but by giving academic credit bank by creating it what we have done is we have formalized institutional learning as well so that i believe is a very very big step the second big step that i see in higher education is this autonomy that is being promised to the institutions of national importance such as the iims and the iits and other educational institutions which do well because the moment you make somebody autonomous you know when i speak to students i say what is the best way for me to help you to realize your own potential and the simple answer is let us be let us do what we wish to do so that we can excel in whatever it is that we wish to do because otherwise predominantly the social pressure drives children in a certain direction as we know and it more so happens in in our country but now by providing autonomy to the learners and to the participants what we do is we help them realize their potential likewise when you provide autonomy to the institutions of higher education you allow them to realize their true potential the only challenge so along with this opportunity and along with this strength comes a challenge and that challenge is that whatever has been said on paper should be actually implemented when it comes to practice because many a times what we have seen for example let's say this entire thing about 6% of the gdp being spent on education now i still remember that the kothari commission way back in the 60s had recommended exactly the same thing but the successive governments after governments just couldn't get to spend 6% of the gdp into education and therefore even though today in the nep 2020 we are talking about spending 6% of the gdp it should actually happen in practice and that to me becomes extremely important that we do whatever we are saying which is there in the in the uh, nep plan the other thing that uh, uh, you know manish you already spoke about was this entire thing about a national research foundation and i think that's an extremely important step that we have a national research foundation because what it does is it allows us to collaborate and i think attached to that is the nep's contention that we should allow probably the top 100 colleges or universities in the world to set up their campuses in india now there was a bit of a resistance about this saying that you know it's going to increase the cost of education i don't think so the moment you bring in universities from abroad into the country what it is going to do is it is going to increase competition it is going to bring in the best practices 
And therefore, it is going to put a pressure on the institutions in India to actually up their game. And when you up your game, you have to also make sure that simultaneously you control your price, you control your fee. So I don't think education is going to become expensive. I think education is going to become far better. Education is going to become world class. Education is going to become contextual the moment we bring those universities in. Just one red flag over there. And that is we need to watch out as to whatever the remittances that those universities are creating, are generating. Those remittances should stay in the country. So you cannot have the university setting up campuses in India, but the remittances going somewhere else to some other country. And therefore, some kind of regulatory framework may be required for those universities who are planning to set up campuses in India so that the remittances also stay within the country and are used to actually develop those universities or get them into collaboration with the universities and the institutions of higher education in India. So this is so far as the strengths and opportunities are concerned. There was also this little concern saying that introducing internship to children at a younger age may lead to child labor. But by any stretch of imagination, I find that argument bizarre. I don't think it'll lead to child labor. What I think is it'll give children an exposure to the practicality, to the pragmatism of the education that they're receiving. Because one of the big things, or rather one of the uh, big uh, minuses that we have seen in the previous education policies has been that they said that although we are educating people, we are not making them employable. And the reason is that we were so far removed from the industry. We were so far removed from what were the skills that were required. And predominantly today, when we are living in the post fourth industrial revolution world, we have to talk about those skills which would be required. Otherwise, what Manish Ji pointed out that demographic dividend might become a demographic disaster because we might be skilling our youth in those areas which are not even required in the world that we are going to see tomorrow. And therefore, this connect is extremely important. So to me, this is one of the very big strengths of NEP 2020, that it says that we have to provide internship right from a younger age so that students are connected and they know what are those skills that they should be readying themselves for. The one negative, if I were to say so, and, and, and that is a challenge that we need to kind of understand, all the countries, this education policy is not merely a statement of purpose. This education policy is a statement of philosophy. And this philosophy is based on what we have been saying through whatever it is, the knowledge that has been generated in the Indian culture. And we have tried to grasp a lot from our culture, just like all the developed countries do. But one of the things that Chanakya said, now, somebody might say that I'm biased. Of course, I'm biased because I'm in the position where I would be receiving. But Chanakya said that the highest salaries in any country should be reserved for their teachers and for their armed forces. Now, this education policy, the new education policy, although it has a complete chapter for teachers, does not talk about what are you going to do for the teachers. And I think that needs to come in the plan of action. So I'm assuming that this NEP 2020 will be followed by a plan of action. And my sense is that the first, and which is why I said that since I have my skin in the game, I happen to be a teacher. So somebody might say that, hey, this is a self-serving kind of statement. But I would stick my neck out and say that the highest salaries should be reserved for teachers in the primary school level. What we get in the higher education are children who are already bright. So for example, in IMs, we get people who are already bright because we actually filter them through a process of the common admission test. But at the primary level, I think teachers have the highest responsibility. They are the ones who shape those children. And then when they come to us, they are already shaped. And therefore, what I am saying is, and I'm sticking my neck out and making this statement, why not pay? good teachers three to four times the salary you know that will do two things one is it's going to motivate teachers because they are going to know that their role in shaping the future of the country is being acknowledged and second it is going to actually reward the teachers who perform well and put some kind of a pressure on those teachers who are not performing well to actually up their game and then start thinking of participant 
as the center of the education system rather than the teacher as the center of the education system. So I, this is something that I would like to see. So this is the first thing and probably the only thing on my wish list, apart from the fact that everything that has been said needs to be implemented in its true spirit. And second, make a system, increase the salary by three times, four times, five times, whatever, but make sure that you get the best brains of the country, not only into the institutions of higher education, but you get the best brains of the country also into the teaching profession. And particularly, as I said, in the primary section. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop my thing here and I'll wait for the questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rai. Uh, it is really a uh, very uh, insightful analysis of the national educational policy, throwing light on the main strengths as well as some uh, challenges which are otherwise opportunities, as you pointed out, like increasing the uh, teacher salary, recognizing their uh, uh, all important role in shaping the future. Thank you very much, sir. Now, uh, I would uh, request uh, CEO uh, Academy Education Group Dubai, Mr. Subramanian Krishnamurti, to kindly share his perspective on the policy and to provide insights on the potential this policy has in transforming the higher education sector of India. Over to you, Mr. Krishnamurti. Good morning. Am I audible? Deep, if you could just give me a voice. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. You're audible. Yeah. Perfect. What a bright morning this is turning out to be. Um, it's widely believed that of uh, thousands of thoughts that we get in a day, about 70% of them are usually negative. And uh, I'm very thankful to PIB for organizing this morning discussion where we've already started with two inspiring speeches, one from uh, Manishji and uh, other from Himanshu Rai. And uh, what I would try to do is uh, I would try to share uh, some stories which has impacted us as educationists and as all the educationists at Macademia believe that we just share stories. We keep sharing stories and stories and stories and we deeply believe that the stories will inspire people to learn by themselves. The learning should happen from within. Um, and uh, like um, Himanshu rightly pointed out, uh, the, the progression in learning is simply nothing but realization of your own ignorance as you go forward. So we are probably realizing that a little uh, too early, but that's why we share stories. We'll start with the first story of uh, the evening today uh, is about uh, the Kinshasa. Just about all the stories, you'll find a credit on the right hand side corner uh, of who has written these stories. And uh, therefore, it's, in case if you want to go back and refer to this article, you could uh, look it up on the internet. Uh, the Kinshasa scale of two cities goes like this uh, in the Democratic of Congo uh, on the base of Mount Nafulu. There was uh, a gas station that was built after five to seven years of grueling effort. And uh, the gas station owner very randomly thought, why not put up a lamppost around here, you know, just randomly. And since it was connected to the gas station, it had 24 hours of uninterrupted electricity. And because the electricity started firing up the lamppost, slowly the cafes and bars started opening up in and around that. And slowly the, the buses that would go to the Mount Nafalu started stopping at, at this lamppost so that the people could you know hang out at the bar or uh, have a grab a coffee. The, Hotel around there, Fakun Hotel started picking up quite well. And it the whole civilization came up in, in less than a year's time to an extent where the government had to step in and say, you can't actually continue to open anything in, in, in that particular area without the permission of the government. Now, that is the impact of one lamppost. Okay. Uh, why stories? What, what is the context of my presentation to you? Any policy which is introduced by any government or the policy makers uh, is will not become a huge success unless it is not embraced by all the stakeholders. And the largest of the stakeholders in this is the 1 billion population who are either parents or students who are likely to experience this. Uh, so my story is, is to is to motivate you to warm up and embrace NEP uh, so that it becomes a huge success. So what does the light bulb have to do with what NEP has to do? What NEP wants to do is they want to put up a lamppost in every single district in India. That is what 
the Indian government and the policymakers want to do, which is a, a huge and an audacious goal. But once a goal is set, the only way you can actually proceed is towards that. Doesn't matter how far you go, the goal has been set and the journey has already begun there. Large multidisciplinary universities and colleges, but most importantly, imagine one multidisciplinary university being available every district and how much wonder you can it can do uh, to the entire country. Um, the second most important thing, uh, which for me stood out very, very drastically is uh, about uh, the inclusion of people of determination and making provision for them in the education system, in the higher education system, especially. Uh, why is it important? Again, I'll take you back to a, a story courtesy. In fact, it's written by one of the information bureau officer called us Mr. Santosh. Uh, where he mentions about the conversation between a student and an anthropologist, Margaret Mead. When Margaret Mead was once asked, what do you think was a point where human beings got civilized, which led us to the growth of human beings to where we are today? And without blinking an eye, she quickly said 15,000 years ago, there was a point when we actually discovered a, a thigh bone, which was fractured and healed. Uh, you know, especially for archaeologists 15,000 years old. Uh, she went on to explain the importance of it by saying that 15,000 years ago, if somebody got injured in the thigh bone, they would be left as a prey because animals had to constantly move, including human beings, for their own prey and their own safety. And the moment your thigh bro is, bone is broken, you are usually left to die as a prey wherever you are. And she says, 15,000 years ago, if somebody took care of one person to heal the Hatai bone for a period of six months, probably means that one human being who's stronger started caring for another human being who is weaker from the same fraternity. And that care for each other, which comes in the hierarchy level, is one of the milestones for uh, the human beings to reach where they are today. And, and that's an extremely important point. So what is the context of NEP here? NEP, uh, which aims to increase the uh, enrollment ratio to more than 50%, I think a huge contribution there would come if we can start doing something about the people of determination. The people of determination often uh, have the zeal to do something, but uh, the physical infrastructures, for example, doesn't allow them to access the universities. The learning materials, for example, prevents them from writing an examination or participating in a course successfully and so on and so forth uh, bringing that focus for me it's a very, it's a very small highlight but it's a huge uh, highlight in a human context the amount of human context that it, it brought uh, to the whole document uh, is tremendous the only uh, only uh, point of uh, uh, regret for me is they decided to use uh, uh, the word special needs instead of people of determination if that could have been rephrased i would have been much more happier uh, but a small paragraph, which really is very, very impressive. Uh, we started caring for each other and that, that will go a long way in uh, improving this. The third one in a country like India, where a huge number of population still uh, almost have to work on a daily basis to make their ends meet. Uh, going to a university full time and studying will always remain a privilege, at least for the next couple of decades. And uh, that is where the stress on the open distance learning that the government is trying to put in to increase the quality of education in open distance learning as almost similar to studying in a, in a primary institute uh, is an important step in that direction. Like, for example, if you go for a recruitment process today, if you say you have a degree from IGNO, uh, an open program, uh, it is not considered as, as good as probably studying in a full time university, whereas you may have studied with more uh, zeal and vigor during your university time. Uh, therefore, uh, the open distance learning, increasing the quality will have a huge impact. Uh, the story that comes to my mind, uh, one of the biggest success stories from India, I try to take all the stories as far as possible from India so that we, we truly embrace the NEP policy with an open arms and, and hug it and uh, take it forward. So uh, I'm sure most of you would know Sugata Mishra from the educational context. Uh, he did this experiment called as hole in the wall and incidentally he's not a teacher. Uh, he randomly became a teacher, but uh, he and his friend randomly decided to put up two computers in Kalkaji in an underprivileged area with the screen visible, keyboard is accessible and the mouse is accessible in 1999. And after six months, when they went back to the same place and when interacted with the children, all the children almost knew how to operate the computer, how to download the games, uh, 
how to uh, how to send email how to create accounts etc etc and what is was what was more surprising was sugata came back and said they they all had their own terminologies for describing a computer because they never been taught for example in the olden times used to have an arrow so usko teer bolte the sir teer ko yahan dabaoge to ye khulta hai and then uh, the hour glass which shows is a busy sign they'll say ye abhi damru dikh raha hai matlab thoda time lagega isko khulne ke liye and so on and so forth the damru and teer and all are the terminologies that they came up with with on their own um, and uh, they picked up the computer which is called as self organized le- learning he calls it as uh, minimally invasive education uh, but the most important outcome of that in in 1999 this is where it started uh, there was a student who passed out of yale university uh, with a phd in evolutionary biology who had his start uh, of exposure to computers and the world from the hole in the wall experiment in 1999 two computers put up in a location with zero teacher can have so much of an impact imagine making open distance learning effective and equivalent to the primary uh, institutes like the iim the nits the iits the state engineering colleges and so on imagine the amount of impact it would have on the progress of the country i i'm i think it's it's going to be immense uh another very very important uh, point that was picked up uh, in nep which i have a lot of respect for is uh, the faculty integrity and the institutional leadership it's it's a it's an extremely important story that needs to be told uh the greatest example that comes to my mind is uh, the man smiling on the screen right now rajiv mathai a lot of us again would be very familiar with who he is uh, not a day passes in i am amdabad in, in the fame corridors there Uh, without his name being mentioned at least once for something that is happening today in 2020 which gets attributed to him way back in 1965 um, and of all the stories the greatest story that i always remember about him from uh, the campus is after being a director for the first term when he decided to he entered into the second term a year into the second term he realized that directorship is something that should be uh, kept for a for a maximum of one term to ensure that uh there is no greater control vested on one particular person and then he decided to move out of the directorship office and everybody very curiously asked him oh rajiv mathai why are you stepping down from being a director to become a professor back again at iim amdabad uh, to which he said the director's position is not hierarchical he is only the first among equals and i am not stepping down i am stepping out i'm not stepping down and i'm stepping out to me is hallmark of uh, the faculty integrity and institutional leadership which this country has experienced in am- amongst many many leaders uh, including one leader who joined us today uh, uh, professor himanshu roy these are unsung heroes of the nation building exercise that india has undertaken since the 19- 1947 since we got freedom the vikram sarabhai the homi babas uh, and and the rajiv mathai Uh, my only request which i have already written to uh, the minister of education as well or now uh, re- renamed as ministry of education latest now uh, is to please include them in the textbook our children need to read these inspiring stories to become one like them if a country needs soldiers like him, professor himanshu roy rightly pointed out through the chanakya we need soldiers and teachers to build the nation that's it one builds the nation other protects the nation you know so if we want to inspire more and more young students to become teachers by choice and not by chance it is important that these stories be told to people from a young age uh, as young as you know uh, the middle school or the primary school and we have enough examples that, uh, for us to pick up and uh, go through uh, i think this is an area which uh, 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 himanshu roy would be able to articulate much much better uh, because he is leading an institution which is hallmark for uh, autonomy of faculty and uh, uh, the institutional leadership i would be very curious to hear his perspective um and the next one this is the liberal arts thing uh, i'm i'm trying to use an american example here because the nep tried to uh, is has very clearly indicated that they want to pick up the liberal arts piece from the us uh, therefore i wanted to pick up a success story from us to articulate how uh, having a multidisciplinary university where there is a focus on liberal arts can do wonders on the left of your screen you see vladimir Vladimir is uh, is is a, is a gem of a guy when it comes to uh, predicting earthquakes but until 1981 despite being the head of the most famous 
uh, Science Soviet Academy for Sciences in Moscow for predicting earthquake. He was an utter failure at predicting earthquake. मतलब बोलता था earthquake होएगा नहीं होता था फिर उल्टा you know and on the right hand side you have Alan Lightman. Now Alan Lightman received his PhD from Howard University for with a speciality in American history and politics. Uh, both of them are like chalk and cheese. They come from two extreme uh, sides of uh, the spectrum. Uh, and Alan is 26 years younger to him, by the way. Okay, and and they decide they they happen to meet at university at a particular forum where Alan went back to him and said, "Look, you have a model in which you are continuously able to successfully predict something, and it turns out to be wrong. You know, can you tell me what are the key points that you are actually trying to use, which leads to failure? And then what I will do is I'll try to map it with the American politics." Okay, so if I map it successfully using your principles, I should be able to predict who is failing. Therefore, I will be able to predict who is going to win. And together, they came up with this concept called as the keys to the White House in 1981. Eight consecutive election. Okay, a mathematical geophysics guy, along with a political American history guy, have predicted the outcome of American election. Right, every single time. Now, the question in your mind right now would be to know what did he say for Donald versus Joe Biden. Now, um, uh, that's for you to go and watch. Um, I, I, I don't want to spoil this up. I already seen it, but uh, let's hope he gets it right the ninth time as well as he goes forward into the election this year. Now, that's the power of moving towards a liberal and a multidisciplinary undergraduate education, especially the liberal arts piece that uh, the NEP is trying to have is to have a homegrown MITs and Harvard, which I think is very, very much possible. Uh, provided we put our focus uh, right in there, uh, provided we start ha- showing our love towards liberal arts as an education and and do away from our obsession uh, with engineering and medical. Uh, sorry, Himanshu, to say this to some extent, even MBA as well. Uh, the uh, and and look at the other other careers that that will do wonderfully well both for the country as well as for themselves uh, if they look at it. Um, again, the last piece is. This this is probably in the WhatsApp group of every single Indian. I probably know uh, by now. Uh, Prakash Iyer wrote a beautiful article on the uh, Choluteca Bridge. You know, so this story doesn't need any any introduction. Uh, but the idea is to keep revamping, keep adapting. You know, uh, I'm very happy to see that the NEP has made a conscious effort to give provision for revamping curriculum as 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 often and as necessary as needed uh, as they go forward from here. Uh, the discussion that I'll probably leave open to. Uh, is to uh, is to walk the talk, the NEP as we go from here. Uh, I didn't think any fine prints are needed for walking the talk as we go forward from here. That's it from uh, my side as we uh, open up uh, to more questions and more talks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krishnamurthy. Uh, it was uh, really interesting and uh, you uh, uh, brought out the highlights of the policy in a very uh, engaging fashion through those uh, anecdotes and stories. You have brought out uh, the virtue of uh, liberal arts education, how uh, the, there's a need for in- sharing stories of inspiring teachers uh, and also the potential that can be unleashed by open and distance learning, among other facets. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Uh, now, uh, one uh, question which I would like to have uh, ask about the multidisciplinary undergraduate education system is uh, what are some possible precautions we would need to bear in mind as we go ahead with the multidisciplinary uh, education system, especially at undergraduate level? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you don't need any precautions uh, like Subhu pointed out that uh, you know in MBA we perhaps have a paucity but here I would like to talk about the undergraduate program that we have at IIM Indore. It's called the Integrated Program in Management and till last year we were the only IIM who had that particular program and that particular program when the students come after class 12 in the first three years they do subjects related to philosophy, political science, economics, statistics, languages, theater, music, and thereafter quantitative methods. So as you can see, we have brought together what was called in the Upanishadic theory, a multifaceted education system, and it works beautifully. I'm particularly extremely proud of this particular program. 
the only thing that needs to be kind of taken care of is that all of this has to come together in some kind of a structure which means that you must make sure that they are getting the inputs at the right time for example there was a little bit of a brouhaha about introducing languages very early now all the psychologists are unanimous in the opinion that a child of four can speak understand and completely comprehend at least four languages if not more and therefore we must introduce those languages just like the nep and visages at the right time so if at all there is a solid foundation which is given at the pre primary primary and the secondary level of the schools when they come here for the undergraduate program we can structure the courses accordingly assuming that they have already had a foundation in some of these things that we are talking about so i think that's the only thing that we need to consider and the second thing is this a uh, big time leaning towards making everything more quantitative that needs to be relooked at because unfortunately what happens in our system and what has happened historically in our system that we have not understood the difference between maths and arithmetic we kind of confuse between the two and and the thing which is actually focused on is arithmetic whereas what we should be focusing on in the early days is the math which is a logic part of it arithmetic would come subsequently i'm mean, solving equations is not math math is understanding the logic behind that and therefore if math is introduced at a much younger age and math in the form of math not in the form of arithmetic then many of those problems that we see subsequently at the undergraduate level when we start bringing in the, those kind of uh, subjects are going to go away and particularly even at the mba level so we will be happy that we do have a lot of uh, innovative courses and which i would recommend the nep does talk about it but i would make some very specific recommendations for example personally i taught three courses uh, in my previous institution when i was teaching one is of course negotiation which is my bread and butter and thankfully it is one of the skills which would be required in the post fourth industrial revolution world and so i'm told so i'm i'm good out there the second was a subject called leadership through literature which means i we, we used to pick up and this i taught uh, with another colleague of mine we used to pick up pieces of literature and then by analyzing those pieces of literature we build frameworks of leadership and the pieces of literature for example that we picked up were uh, herman hess by siddharth so we had a global perspective we picked up othello by shakespeare we picked up uh, yugant which is a feminist perspective on mahabharat by iravati karve we picked up my experiments with truth gandhi's autobiography we picked up beyond the last blue mountain which was a biography of jari tata and when we analyzed these by looking at them through certain lenses the lessons that we got were tremendous and the third subject i taught was a subject called justice ethics and morality where we spoke about the concept of fairness what is fair and what is unfair and what is the difference between morality and ethics because more often than not once again people take them as interchangeable terms but morality is completely different something which is given to us by society our religion perhaps our family values ethics is very very contextual and at least in the world of leadership it is an ethical question which becomes far more significant which is contextualized in a particular situation rather than morality so i think we need more of these subjects the only thing is you need to make them contextual and the students know the participants know that these are the subjects which actually come in handy so when we talk to our alumni they say you know all the functional subjects great they did make us this they did give us this information they did give us this skill but the subject which helped us the most was something like communication something like negotiation because they said ultimately this is what we do we collaborate with people we try to resolve conflicts and therefore i think more attention needs to be paid to these interdisciplinary subjects sir thank thank you very much sir for uh, uh, throwing light on how multidisciplinary focus will change our education system in especially preparing our youth to face the challenges of the 21st century which are all the more multidisciplinary cutting across various disciplines and fields oh uh, i have one question to mr krishnamurthy uh, sir you have worked in vocational education i would request you to please throw some light on the challenges involved in integrating vocational education into the higher education system of the country right Uh, one of the challenges that we've been facing with respect to the vocational education in in indian space 
uh, is it is very de-glamorized uh, for uh, for unknown reasons. Um, uh, the moment I say ITI, the kind of images that conjures up in your mind uh, is is not not very pleasant. And uh, w one of the biggest boosts that we can possibly do as we go forward from here, especially we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution context, um, the plumbing skills are going to be there. The 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 one of the biggest difference that I've seen in terms of uh, the conversation that especially happened post COVID about the manufacturing units coming back to India instead of going to China. Uh, one of the biggest gap that was pointed out was how skilled the Chinese workers are. And even if these companies wanted to move out of China, they do not really have an alternative where you can find such skilled workforce to be able to outsource that work. It's like, I really want to get out of China, but I can't get out because these guys are so skilled or a, or a well-trained mechanism. Uh, so the idea is to de-glamorize it because there is there is a lot of scope for, for development, for entrepreneurship, as well as for uh, uh, daily wages. Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the, the, the institutions which offers degree should stop linking the degrees with jobs. That's that's probably one of my biggest, um, uh, you know, problem with, with the Indian universities where in the, in the prospectus you will find how many students we placed at what price, you know. Uh, and so, so that kind of uh, put sets you up a mind. If I go here, I will get this much money. If I go here, I will get this much money. Uh, what you don't really understand is what are your core skills and how your core skills can actually help you achieve the livelihood that is good for you. Uh, and the, the moment we de-glamorize it, I think Aditya Birla Academy has had taken a, a wonderful step in that direction uh, by setting up something in Chhattisgarh. Uh, I, I don't think it turned out very well for them, but they made a huge investment in that direction. Uh, I, and I had an opportunity to visit that setup. Uh, when, when I entered that setup, I really felt like it was much uh, comparable to most of the engineering colleges or in some way much better than that uh, and and their main job was to uh, was to offer vocational education across the manufacturing uh, sector uh, i think that is what is needed it is it is important for us to bring back the glamour uh, uh, to 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 these professions you know uh, like my brother in the us always used to say that um, the the plumber who comes to his house always comes in a more expensive car than him um, and and plums and goes back uh, there's a lot of glamour in these vocations and, and we need to just bring those glamour back, you know, and, and make it look, if you have a core skill, you know, if combined with a good education, you can you can make a livelihood. We should be able to make that visible for people to see. Okay, thank you, Mr. Krishnamurthy. Uh, there's a need for... Yeah, just one second. You explained it very well. I mean, uh, this national education policy lays a focus on apprenticeship and internship programs also. I mean, are we in any way, like, I mean, for example, let's take the example of Germany or the Western world, most of the Western world, and to an extent China also, where higher education is for the academically competent. In India, everyone, like, I mean, it's the bachelor's degree, master's degree. I mean, we, as uh, Professor Iman Surajurai pointed out earlier, I mean, we have produced graduates and postgraduates in numbers and without any employability skills. Uh, does this national education policy is a water, watershed in that? I mean, does it try to break the whatever the prototype that is there in India? Himant, you want to take it or you want me to? No, sure, I, I, I agree that Actually, both is... can answer. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll go off. So, so it, 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 has brought in, it has brought in that uh, element uh, by talking about apprenticeship. And I think Subhu's point is extremely important, not just from the perspective of looking at it from, uh, you know, what are the skills uh, that are required. We also need to understand, once again, what Manish Ji spoke about, this entire demographic dividend. It'll turn to a demographic disaster if we don't have jobs for these youth. And the jobs are going to be, see, most many of the jobs, predominantly the blue collar to even some of the white collar jobs are going to disappear. Because you will have robotics come in, you will have uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning coming in and therefore doing those jobs better and better. But some of the jobs which will always remain is, say, plumbing. You still need a plumber to come and, uh, you know, take care of your thing. An electrician, who you still need somebody to come and, uh, considering that we are a supremely lazy bunch of people, we don't like to change our own bulbs. <laughs> we still need somebody to come and change our bulbs or, you know, replace the fuse and so on and so forth. And therefore, we need people. In fact, I was having a chat with the secretary of the Panchayati Raj. And he said that, you know, Himanshu, I would want to have 
a multi skill person what we used to call a handy man or a handy woman handy one such person in every two three villages and the person will automatically i mean we have 650000 villages so we we need to have such people because it will also generate employment for these people so if you have one person who's trained in these multiple skills and you have that person he'll automatically get called by say two three villages uh, around wherever this person lives so i think it's an extremely important point nep does address it but as i said i'm still looking i'm still waiting for the plan of action to see as to how it is going to be implemented i think the apprenticeship uh, and and internship makes makes way for uh, people to actually get a glimpse of what happens in the real world which is been predominantly missing in the indian education system for for whatever said and done i think except bits pilani which has got a 6 2 6 months of immersion into the industry which is compulsory as part of their grade uh, in uh, even other engineering colleges it's it's kind of optional so uh, i think the it, it's somehow even if making it mandatory for them to to spend some time in the field or in the industry or in the workplace uh, would actually would address the gap between what they are learning and and what where they need to be Uh, so that the companies doesn't have to recruit people and train them in the first six months to make them employable. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, both of you. And now we will uh, go for the audience uh, questions. Uh, let we will first take a question from Miss Anne Francis. Her question is: uh, By promoting uh, multi, um, okay. Her question is: How much importance or relevance is provided in promoting research in various fields in the NEP, especially in higher education? Uh, so there, there is yeah. this uh, entire concept uh, of having a a national research uh, framework which is already there uh, the national research foundation which is there in the nep so i think uh, the nep has very very clearly outlined the importance of research what i would like to see subsequently and i think that's where uh, ans question becomes extremely uh, pertinent is that how much of collaborative research are we doing are we collaborating even within the institutions that we have for example i'll just give you an example and once again this is not to Uh, this is not to criticize but this is to point out as to how we were missing out on opportunities so indore has this unique distinction of having both an iim and iit so we are it's, it's only city which has both an iim and an iit but much to my surprise before i came to this place uh, you know i i took over my charge a year and a half back we did not have any collaboration and which is which to my mind was bizarre i mean here are two great institutions and we should be doing a lot of things together so now we have we, we are in the process of uh, signing an mou we are doing a lot of uh, work uh, i have been nominated to their senate and i attend the meetings of iit indore and now we are trying to do a lot of things together including joint courses where we bring technology and management together we are also doing a lot of researches together in fact there is a, a a particular grant that they have gotten from the department of science and technology and we are also putting in some projects and subsequently we are also going to set up joint incubation centers so that we can have uh, startup enthusiasts come get their technical information and mentorship from them get their managerial intervention and managerial uh, uh, managerial mentorship from us and therefore together we think we can do a lot of things so and the importance is there it is extremely relevant nep talks about it i think in the implementation we have to actually make sure that we bring the institutions in a collaborative mode so far as the great institutions within our country are concerned and i think we'll be on the right track okay thank you sir uh, our so second true. so it's so important you know uh, oh sorry oh, I, is, no, is it okay if i add a bit here yeah yeah sure sure please uh in fact uh, one of the common misconception that uh, people have in terms of the the highest revenue making industries in the world normally considered defense pharma bfsi uh, people do miss out on the amount of patent wealth that good universities sit upon so i always keep saying this good universities are not universities where only students learn good universities are universities where the teachers also learn or the faculty also learn you know where the faculty come together and collaborate and do a lot of research with either their their peers or peers from other departments or to some extent even uh, the other universities what a wonderful initiative uh, himanshu i really had to say this i mean it it takes a, a leader to to come up with uh, thoughts like this you know th this is what we need this is a kind of uh, institutional leadership that should enter our textbooks i'm you know these are the kind of stories that should that should you know find a way to our textbooks and at least the mainstream media so that 
uh, more and more people will get ideas about how to take this country forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Ms. Riyanka Chatterjee. Her question is, does the NEP give equal recognition and weightage to distance learning as uh, what it does to regular courses in higher education and uh, as to uh, professional courses? She's saying that there were some uh, discrepancies uh, earlier. Who would like to take that question, please? Uh, So uh, I think yeah. uh, Subhu has already spoken about it, that uh, distance learning needs to be given importance. NEP does give recognition. It does give weight. Uh, I'm not too sure, Shriyanka, what does it mean when you say equal recognition? For the simple reason that if what is meant by that is that uh, would the learning from distance education be the same as that of, uh, say, an in-class or learning through, a, say, a synchronous or an asynchronous mode. We are still trying to grapple with this problem so far as higher education is concerned, because now that we are getting into blended learning, so I'm not talking about distance learning so far, but even when we are talking about blended learning, we are trying to see as to how much of an in-class hour should be considered as equivalent to in terms of an online hour. And within online hour, you then have the synchronous mode and then you have the asynchronous mode. So we are coming up with some kind of formula. But then, as I said, this is a this is a point of implementation. And I need to see the action plan as to how is the NEP going to address that. Or I'm assuming that NEP would also take inputs uh, from uh, academicians, uh, particularly those from the higher education institutions, even while uh, the implementation is going on. The weightage, the weight is there so far as uh, distance learning is concerned. But like Subhu pointed out, we have to strengthen distance learning because this distance learning, he gave the example of IGNU. Now, we have so many people actually studying from IGNU. We also have people doing their you know, higher education uh, from IGNU. But then we need to strengthen the IGNU system so that the quality of education and by quality of education, I mean the quality of content. I have looked at uh, some of the course material that IGNU produces, and it is far from satisfactory. You know, and if you don't even like to see what you have in your hands, uh, rest assured you're not going to read it. So all you do is try to pass the exam and get that degree or get that uh, prefix before your name that uh, Dr. So-and-so. But the prefix means nothing unless there has been a learning involved with it. So I think the, the strengthening of the distance education, therein lies the key. And once it is strengthened, then I don't see as to why it should be taken as any different from a degree which is uh, earned elsewhere. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so true. But on, on a positive note, we are also on a, on, a, on a beautiful moment of change in the whole education industry where the blended learning, like uh, Himanshu rightly pointed out, has become an accepted form of learning. I mean, earlier, the consumer behavior was different. If you go to school, you're studying. If you're not going to school, you're not studying. And that whole perception has changed now. Uh, now, now, probably now is the time for us to strengthen the you know, open distance learning and, and make it more accessible. Like, for example, uh, Himanshu Roy's negotiation class can probably be echoed in almost every BBA school in this country You know, using technology today, which probably would not have been possible let's say, or unfathomable 10 years ago, it's possible for with so much of smart note, uh, uh, smartphone penetration, uh, Geo Dandanadan uh, uh, 3G accounts that we get with data at a cheap cost. Uh, now is the time to explode and go ballistic on this open distance learning and get our next generation skilled as best as we can. You know. Thank you. Our uh, Let's take the next question from Mr. Prashant Patrabe from Bhopal. This question is, uh, do you think the NEP addresses problems of uh, income and gender disparities in enrollment, faculty quality, and lack of motivation among students. Who would like to take that, please? <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting question because I don't think, uh, uh, Prashant, that there is a simple answer to this because one of the things that I get a sense from, from some of the questions is as if uh, NEP is the panacea for all social evils that this country faces and NEP is the answer to you know everything and suddenly you know we'll have a Ram Rajya because the NEP has come in. I mean NEP is about the national education policy but alongside NEP we also need a social movement. For example if you if you look at the discriminatory practices that our country has 
been facing or, or has been practicing for the past thousand years, be it discrimination against women, be it discrimination against uh, certain sections of the society. Discrimination will not go away merely because you make a structural change, just because you made a law saying that if you do this, if you speak ill about a particular community, if you speak ill about a particular religion, if you speak ill about a particular gender, you will be punished. Discrimination will not go away. Simultaneously, like what Gandhi said, I mean, that, that was the debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar at that point of time. I don't want to digress. But what Gandhi said was that structural change alone can never remove discrimination. There has to be a social change as well. So while NEP will obviously create opportunities, equal opportunities for people coming from disparate income groups, from disparate uh, backgrounds, etc. For example, at IIM. At IIM, nobody is denied education for the want of money. We make sure that we provide help. The banks queue up outside IIM to provide bank loans to people who make in. But at the same time, that still does not mean that everything has become hunky-dory. Why? Because as a society, we do not spend on the education of the girl child. So as a society, I think we need to bring about a social change where we actually train where we actually educate the parents that there is no limit to the potential of a child. For example, a person coming from a certain kind of a background, the parents themselves put a limit to his or her aspiration saying, hum log middle class wale, hum yahi tak sochte hain, ye bano. Now, till such time that we bring about a social movement and say, look, you have to realize your own potential and there is no limit to human potential, no matter what the background. Till such time, that the girl child in a family is given the same amount of nutrition as the male child. Multiple researchers have proved that if you have girls and boys in the family, girls get less nutrient food. If two roti bani hai, then two roti bachche ko, jo, jo male bachcha hai, usko khilai jayegi, na ki female bachche ko. So you're not even letting that mind grow. You're not even providing the nutrition for that mind to be fully developed. And then obviously there are several. So yesterday or day before yesterday, I was talking to, you know, one of the helps uh, 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 parents. And I said, uh, kya kar rahi hai? school ja rahi hai ki bole, wo school ja nahi sakti. Wo school mein maha jane mein bada problem hai, safe nahi hai. And therefore, when you have these issues that the child, a girl child cannot go to the school because she's a girl. And because there are safety issues, no matter what the NEP does, nothing is going to happen. So Prashant, I'm not trying to put in a, a pessimistic view. What I'm saying is that apart from NEP, we have to do a whole lot of things. And I think the intelligentsia, the academic institutions, as well as the social institutions, government and non-government and citizens like you and me have to come together and create that samajik jagrupta. We have to create that social movement where we remove those discriminations. And then, of course, the educational institutions can do things at their end. So true. So true. Actually, having women at leadership position is, is such an important aspect. I don't know uh, when the world will wake up to realize this as a possibility. So those who are listening to this, uh, if you are running a business, if you are employed, please ensure that you have uh, the courage to promote women into leadership position because when we do not have women in leadership position we miss out on 50 percent 50 percent of the perspective of the world population you know uh, and so it's not a cute thing to have it's a must thing to have when we don't have women in leadership position you don't know how half of the world is thinking on that particular issue you know uh, and and very very inspiring uh, uh Shoy, the way he puts it unless we don't bring that movement uh, yeah, in the country consciously, like as, as an employer, if I don't take it, if as a leader, I don't take that initiative to promote, uh, uh, we should have the courage to promote them to where they deserve to be. Uh, and then I, I think it it will have a cyclic effect on the society. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one question uh, now from Ms. Archana Mishra. Her question is, uh, how far the global institutions and uh, private sector will be able to facilitate quality education at affordable cost to students. How does the NEP help in achieving this goal? So I think NEP has done two things. One is that it has spoken about uh, providing autonomy uh, to the institutions, which are quality institutions. So I'm assuming, Archana, what you mean is when you talk about global institutions and even the private institutions, you're talking about the good institutions. 
and therefore NEP is talking about uh, you know providing uh, giving more autonomy and when you give more autonomy by and large you must also understand that initially there will be a certain financial outlay which would be required if you want to make an institutional global i mean look at the harvards and the mit's of the world look at the iits and the iims of of our country we did need a lot of capital initially and therefore to assume that a private institution which comes up should not charge fees at all should absolutely uh, keep it uh, you know less than a certain limit should provide free education to a lot of people would actually turn out to be wishful thinking they need to infuse the capital and they need the funding they need the source of capital uh, you know having worked with the tatas one of the things uh, for eight and a half years i worked with tata steel in jamshedpur and one of the things that tatas always said and tatas nobody can question tatas when it comes to the amount of work that they do for the society i mean by by far by far even before the 2% uh, thing had come up about corporate social responsibility i still remember when i was working with tata steel we used to spend 11 to 12% on social causes so when the in fact when this 2% rule came in we said hmm are we supposed to reduce it or what i mean that was just a joke because we were spending uh, so much more but one of the things that jn tata said and subsequently jrd tata that to distribute wealth you have to first create wealth and that is what tatas have always done they have created wealth and then they have distributed it making money is not a bad thing please remember what you do with that money once you have made it that becomes important and that can make it good or bad so likewise educational institutions private educational institutions will first need the capital subsequently what are they doing with the capital are they filling up the coffers of the founder or are they putting the money back into the institutions to convert them into world class institutions that's what matters and i think the nep is going to bring out some checks and balances where they see that the monies are not taken out of the institutions but are pumped back into the institutions but to assume that everything should come at uh, you know zero or a very little cost i don't think that would be a practical thing to even imagine or even to wish for okay uh, would you like to add something uh, mr subroni sure i i only wish a uh, money is listening to this <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay fine uh now uh, uh sir you wanted to say something Uh, just a minute. Yeah, one thing is that I mean, uh, Professor Him, Professor Himanshu, you, know, you know that I mean, this NEP has a proposal to bring a overarching regulatory body, an umbrella regulatory body, in the form of a Higher Education Commission of India. How do you think it will roll out? I mean, it... see, so it it does propose to bring the current regulatory bodies under one umbrella. The only thing is that I hope. that the role which is played by this regulatory body is that of a regulator and not that of a, a person who kind of uh, you know keeps trying to control it should not become a controller it should only become a regulator so like like we say that you make the rules and then you come in only if those rules are violated by somebody while giving the entire autonomy to the rest of the people and to the rest of the institution so so long as that regulator plays its role in its true spirit and does not become overarching just like the three pillars of democracy we say that one pillar of democracy should not encroach upon the working of another pillar of the democracy likewise if the regulator stays with its regulatory role i think it's a good idea and in any case we have uh, institutions like ours who will push back just in case the regulators push okay <laughs> that's right and uh, well, one question uh, i have is regarding uh, teacher education uh, uh, would request if uh, maybe mr krishnamurthy or also himanshu is also welcome to answer uh, whether uh, how the nep will be able to fix the teacher education system in the country which the policy itself says is in need of urgent and radical reform absolutely i think uh, uh, i remember reading uh, or listening to one of the professor who said strategy is the art of shutting doors you know he said uh, it it glad we are shutting doors on bet finally uh, uh, a very very outdated and and mundane teacher training process that was in place which basically left the teachers uh, bereft of any skills when they entered the classroom and most of the teachers always end up picking up the the basic brick and mortars of teaching from the first few years of learning and then by the time they become efficient teachers 
uh, it's already like three or four years spent inside the system, you know, and the amount of damages that they would have done in the process of learning while working uh, is immeasurable. Uh, therefore, uh, um, the closest example that I can think of is one of the greatest success of Finland uh, getting to the top. Uh, if you read very carefully, is they they attributed back to the teacher training process going to the university. So they did it about 25, 26 years ago. Uh, they moved, uh, they created an educational framework for teachers. Uh, they created educational setup for teachers where you go and volunteer. You can shadow as a teacher while you are actually doing that program. So you're in a school. Uh, I think it happens at the IMs as well. A new professor walks into the classroom, uh, always gets to a, you know chef, go and sit in the classroom of another professor and see uh, how that is being delivered uh, before they actually walk into their own classrooms uh, a month or a year later. Um, uh, some kind of a teacher framework that they created, which has become very successful, even commercially, uh, become a very popular Finland model as they call it. Though even keep they keep saying don't copy it; it might not work in your country. Uh, but uh, but the the root. Uh, of of the of the teacher education going to university, uh, and then there is an upliftment in the in the in the overall learning ability of the students uh, in higher scores than PISA, higher scores than TIMS. Uh, there is a close correlation between the two, which means the the moment the teacher education becomes more and more finer and more and more real, uh, I think it will have a direct impact on the quality of the learning that the the children are experiencing uh, right now at at our schools and at our universities. Absolutely. So I think Subhu is, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. And just one more thing to add over there to what uh, Subhu has already pointed out brilliantly is that here, I think the attitude of us teachers also needs to change, which means that as a teacher, I have to understand that I have to be a constant learner to be a good teacher. Many a times, a lot of teachers believe that they don't need training because they believe that they already know the subject. But please remember, our scriptures have very clearly pointed out Vidya Dadati Vinayam, Vinya Dadati Patratam. Education has to make you humble because it's only the humility that makes you worthy. And if you're not humble and if you think that you already know everything, you will never become a worthy teacher. And therefore, I think a lot of responsibility lies on our shoulders as well as teachers that we need to be humble and say that we need to constantly learn. We need to constantly improve ourselves. And once we start doing that as teachers, we will try and figure out the avenues from where we can learn and we can constantly update ourselves. So, Professor Himanshu, I think in a sense you have uh, begun your talk with ignorance, quoting Socrates that uh, education is a progressive realization of our ignorance and in a way you have ended also on a note uh, highlighting the need for discovery of our own ignorance. I think uh, we have some more audience questions, but uh, we are terribly short of time. Uh, so, I think it's time to uh, conclude this webinar. It's my privilege to extend a very heartfelt gratitude to Professor Himanshu Rai, first of all, Director IIM Indoor, for joining us and uh, enlightening us with the uh, absolutely contextual uh, perspectives of the various proposals in, uh, in the national education policy and how we can ensure that it uh, becomes a success in the implementation phase as well. Thank you, sir, once again. Uh, I am also uh, very grateful to Mr. Subramanian Krishnamurthy, CEO of Academia Group, uh, for a, such an engaging uh, set of insights on the policy and the various trust areas and what are the focus areas that we need to keep in mind as we go along in implementing this policy as a nation. And uh, last but not the least, I would also extend my heartfelt gratitude to uh, Sri Manish Desai, Director General, West Zone Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, uh, under whose guidance we have been able to organize this webinar. And of course, thanks to all our viewers who have joined us. Uh, uh, we hope that it has been an enriching session for you. And uh, we hope that the national education policy is able to uh, achieve the goals it has set out for the future of our country. Thank you all once again. A very, very good day. Thank you once again. Jai Hind. Ah, Jai Hind. Bye. Jai Hind.